Read anything recently published by popular culture on health and nutrition, you will likely hear about GMOs and their dangers to your health. Many famous public figures have expressed opinions vehemently against GMOs, saying they're unhealthy, full of chemicals, and nothing more than a vehicle for corporate profit. In fact, a 2014 survey by the Pew Research Center shows many Americans have concerns about the safety of GMOs. Some even go so far as to vilify companies that develop GMOs and assist farmers in producing them. So why is there all the controversy? Is there really something to be concerned about? Let's start by asking, what is a GMO? As defined by the World Health Organization, genetically modified foods are foods derived from organisms whose genetic material or DNA has been modified in a way that does not occur naturally, i.e. through the introduction of a gene from a different organism. These organisms are usually crops produced mostly for livestock feed or directly for human consumption and these traits being programmed into the crops can be things like increased beta carotene in the case of golden rice, resistance against bugs or certain diseases as well as traits that can help them grow faster with less resources, produce more and thrive in harsh environments. According to the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, some commonly seen foods that are products of biotechnology are corn, soybeans, potatoes, tomatoes, papaya, and squash. These and other widely consumed plants have been adapted through biotechnology to be more resistant to plant diseases like ring spot and papaya, mosaic virus and squash, rootworm and corn, and blight in potatoes which is a symptom of infection where plants experience chlorosis or loss of chlorophyll which can lead to browning and death of the plant. So we can make a lot of changes to living things to try and solve problems, but when did we start messing with genes? Well, genetically modifying crops began when humans first started to grow and harvest their own food, choosing certain plants and animals that had more desirable traits, and thus breeding from those strains over other plants and animals. As a result of this artificial selection over thousands of years and generations of plants and livestock, these products were domesticated and the phenotypes present differently from their wild ancestors. One example of plant breeding is corn, which is so unnatural corn is unable to survive without human intervention. This is because the kernels are permanently fixed to the cob of the plant and are protected by the husk. Both attributes arose by human artificial selection and prevent the plant from spreading its seeds naturally. As farmers became more well versed in breeding plants and animals with more desirable traits, the method of crossbreeding was developed which involved directly crossing closely related organisms to merge the genome sharing desirable traits. Once the two plants have successfully merged, the offspring often express the desired trait and many other traits that are not. So the process is repeated until the new offspring contain only the desired trait and resemble the original domesticated parent in all other ways. Moreover, only related organisms or similar species can be crossed to produce a viable plant. This limitation is not because it is impossible to cross-pollinate two species from very different genomes. Rather, many common ancestors that would allow this are now extinct. One example of hybridization between two different genomes occurred in the late 1800s when wheat and rye were hybridized to form triticale to tolerate marginal farmland. This approach often proved unreliable and time consuming because breeders had to wait for desirable traits to occur naturally. Therefore, many breeders quickly adopted the process of exposing seeds to numerous mutagens such as x-rays, radiation, or chemicals as technology allowed to increase the rate that mutations occurred. Genetic engineering of organisms removes the limitations of traditional breeding and hybridization techniques. Now scientists can introduce genes from distantly related species in a relatively short amount of time. This process is the result of decades of research involving the discovery and manipulation of DNA. In 1980, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of patenting genetically engineered organisms following the first successful transplantation of a gene from one strain of bacteria to another by Boyer and Cohen in the early 1970s. This saw an explosion of new transgenic organisms ranging from papaya resistant to the ring spot virus in Hawaii, aqua-advantaged salmon with accelerated growth rates, 
golden rice, which contained daffodil genes allowing for the production of beta carotene, preventing human blindness caused by deficiency of vitamin A, and humulin, a class of insulin drugs produced by genetically engineered E. coli bacterium in 1982. The process of engineering an organism for a specific need is very complex and unique to each project. However, they all follow one central concept of gene transfer. So, how do you genetically engineer an organism? GMOs are produced by recombinant DNA technology, which is taking DNA from one organism and putting it into another. There are several important ingredients you need to make a GMO. The DNA, or host cell, a plasmid, restriction enzymes, and the gene of interest. A plasmid is a circular, double-stranded DNA molecule separate from a cell's chromosomal DNA that is capable of independently replicating within the original or host cell. Many plasmids come from bacteria and single-celled eukaryotes like yeast, where they are passed on for future generations of cells via DNA replication and cell division. A good plasmid for DNA cloning has three characteristics, a replication origin, a marker that permits selection, and a region where exogenous DNA fragments can be inserted. Restriction enzymes are endonucleases produced by bacteria that typically recognize a 4-8 to eight base pair sequence called the restriction site. These enzymes cut both strands of DNA at the restriction site, which is often a palindromic sequence of DNA. Much like the word kayak, the restriction site are read the same no matter which direction. Most common types of restriction enzymes produce the sticky ends which have staggered ends that can easily make base pair with other DNA that have been digested by the same restriction enzyme. Once paired, the DNA can be fused by the enzyme ligase which catalyzes the end-to-end -end joining of fragments of DNA. The plasmid is inserted into the host cell via a process called transformation. Once scientists have identified a pr an appropriate plasmid, the DNA is usually selected from a cDNA library, which is stored DNA generated from mRNA by a process called reverse transcription, which utilizes the enzyme reverse transcriptase to produce DNA from RNA much like retroviruses. Both the plasmid and the desired DNA are digested by the same restriction enzyme resulting in strands of DNA with complementary sticky ends that can be sealed together by ligase. This new DNA can then be amplified by PCR, cultured by bacteria, or introduced into the recipient organism through ballistic bombardment. In this method, the DNA is pasted onto particles of tungsten or gold and then are shot into the organism's tissues at a high velocity with a metal or gene gun. Other methods like electroporation and microinjection respectively use electrical pulses to move the DNA into the organism or inject fresh embryos with the desired gene. When successful implantation occurs, the selection markers found on the vector are used to identify cells that incorporated the foreign DNA of cultured in bacteria. In plants, scientists often modify stem cells from the meristem because they are capable of growing into entire plants. This allows each progeny to be identical. Now this explanation is extremely simplified and in reality this process has to be repeated over and over to ensure the genes are actually accepted by the recipient organism. So now that we know what a GMO is, are there risks associated with them? Many critics of GMOs warn about the inability to stop the great GMO experiment like letting the genie out of the bottle, once GMOs are introduced into the biosphere, we cannot undo their effects. These concerns focus on potential health implications, possible effect on unintended organisms, the possibility of the great transgene escape allowing mutated genes to be cross-pollinated into wild relatives, and the reality that many GMOs are monocultures or genetically identical clones with little variability. This lack of genetic diversity might increase a plant's susceptibility to pathogens in a changing environment. The main health concern associated with GMOs is the risk of potential allergens unintentionally being transferred from one species to another. 
This means without appropriate labeling, many consumers may unknowingly consume allergens when eating food that is usually safe, putting people at risk for anaphylactic shock and other signs of allergic reactions. Supporters for GMOs argue that many companies are currently screening for possible allergens and even removing genes that encode for these, like in soybeans. Besides the risk of allergic reactions, many critics of GMOs question their safety that often include toxins that reduce consumption by insects. One example is plants that contain genes from Bacillus thuringiensis, a bacterium that produces Bt toxin, which is poisonous to insects. Critics fear that plants that contain these genes might be dangerous to humans. However, supporters cite that the reason Bt toxin was chosen is its lack of toxicity in vertebrates. This is because Bt toxin is produced as a zymogen, or an active protein, requiring an alkaline environment, like in an insect's gut, to become active. In humans and other vertebrates, the acidity of the stomach destroys the inactive enzyme along before it can become toxic to the vertebrate that consumes it. An interesting side effect of Bt toxin was observed in corn. Corn containing the transgenic gene also had less mycotoxin than non-Bt corn. Pumonisin or mycotoxin is produced by a fungus that infects insect-damaged corn. Since corn with Bt toxin often contains less damage by insects, it also contained less pumonisin, which is known to cause birth defects and to be a carcinogen. To date, many studies conducted by multiple governing bodies, including the USDA and FDA, have failed to find any adverse health effects caused by the consumption of GMO foods that were not commiserate with the consumption of non-GMO foods. One such review was done under the direction of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, where 20 scientists over the course of two years reviewed over 900 publications on the subject of GMO consumption and health where they concluded that currently transgenic foods were as safe to consume as non-transgenic foods. However, anti-GMO groups raised the concerns over nutrient content of transgenic crops, demanding that they be labeled apart from non-transgenic crops. Europe has government bureaucracies devoted specifically to the labeling and regulation of GMO products apart from non-GMO foods, whereas the U.S. has absorbed transgenic crops under existing regulatory agencies. As of July 1, 2016, the state of Vermont voted in favor of mandating products containing genetically modified food to be labeled accordingly. Many critics of GMOs question how these affect the environment as well as farmers and the agricultural industry. These concerns center around fallout from widespread use of GMO seed, inadvertently getting mixed with the local ecosystem and passing on its genetic material. Risks of passing on pest-resistant traits to plants that insects need to survive could cause an overgrowth in that plant and the insects are no longer there to keep it in check, thus causing a shift in the balance of flora and fauna. However, supporters of GMOs argue that many different strategies are currently being utilized to prevent transgenes from hybridizing with native plants such as inducing sterility, sterility in transgenic plants, thereby preventing production of pollen in transgenic plants and any offspring. This means that they will still produce seeds, but without pollen they cannot fertilize or hybridize with non-transgenic plants. Another solution is to place the transgene in the chloroplast, which are passed by a maternal inheritance much like mitochondria, so the transgene cannot be passed by pollen. Also, flowers can be designed not to open or to be apomixes, forcing GMOs to only replicate by self-pollination and preventing pollen from escaping. Therefore, many supporters of GMOs argue that though critics have reasonable concern over the safety of GMOs and possibility of plants hybridizing with wild species, they believe with appropriate precautions this risk can be minimized. Other concerns have been raised about keeping struggling farmers dependent upon expensive patented materials, resulting in farmers becoming dependent on more expensive seeds and limiting choices of pesticides and herbicides to those made by the company of the GMO. 
Jack Heinemann of the University of Canterbury in New Zealand argued that by comparing yields between GMO production in the U.S. and non-GMO farms in Western Europe, there is no conclusive indication that GMOs result in more food being produced. However, many biotech companies argue that certain states have dramatically increased yields compared to other states in the U.S., so it's not a fair comparison. This has been key in the debate in whether or not to employ transgenic crops to alleviate malnutrition and food insecurity in developing populations around the world. Proponents for biotech food claim that it will make progress towards solving world hunger, thus not employing this technology is immoral. While skeptic populations are stating the importance of tight controls and regulatory institutions to ensure safe practices and global justice. Biotechnological foods, transgenic crops, genetically modified organisms are another chapter in a long history of humans programming plants and livestock to suit our needs. More research and communication between governing bodies, scientists, and the public needs to be done to ensure this technology is employed safely and ethically fulfilling the needs of a growing population while protecting the environment.